You are here because you have seen the imminent destruction of the United States of America as we know it. It began with COVID. It began with fear. We were forced into lockdown. No work, no school, no social interactions. The only form of communication was social media and mainstream media, both of which are compromised. Then the stimulus checks were sent out to quell us, to keep us calm. Then tracking and tracing was implemented. Then riots began. Then the defunding of our law enforcement. Then the systematic destruction of our historical monuments. This is no longer about a virus. This is about control. This is about the destruction of the Constitutional Republic our forefathers fought and died for 244 years ago. They want us to keep the fight on social media where they control the narrative. They want us in our homes, muzzled with masks, arguing with our friends over what happens next. They want us afraid. They want us to feel helpless. They want us to wait until the fight comes to our homes our house so that one at a time they can slowly pick us apart they want to make an example of us and do it while we're not organized when we're not in great numbers or in masses this is not about a virus this is about division this is about taking away our freedoms one at a time slowly so that by the time we recognize what's happening it is too late you are witnessing the destruction of the Republic and the installation of socialism and communism. But you are here because you've seen this all coming. You are here because you have a voice that has not been heard. You are here because you are the lifeblood of this great nation. We are the silent majority. And we are done being silent. For massive change to occur, massive action must be taken. I want you to remember this. It comes straight from our Declaration of Independence. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. This fight is in your hands. The success of this mission is in your hands. Nothing like this has ever been done before. And I'll say it again. We are the silent majority. We are limitless. We will succeed. This is our country and we are taking it back. Patriots, this is your call. We stand for freedom, liberty, and the Constitution. We will combat all those who are corrupt. We are America's insurance policy. We will not see our republic fall. We are everywhere. We are the 3%. That is a key motto among a band of brothers I became part of back in 2017 called the 3%ers. I guess from an unofficial standpoint, I became a part of them back in 2008 when I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me. But who's really counting time, especially at a time where there is seemingly more of it than we know what to do? in light of the latest pandemic, the coronavirus. 
I would say that I have always been patriotic to the core, and that a dedication and patriotism peaked for the first time when I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps back in December of 2007. It would peak again at the highest level just shy of a decade later when the very things I believed in came under siege. To show up to Oxford, or if you live in Oxford and can, uh, can show up to the square at six o'clock with your flags to show support for the state of Mississippi, please do. All right, please do. If you're not able to show up, what you can do to help is please share this live stream so that we can get some flaggers out there. I need as many. What's up guys, I'm back live. Y'all got to see me put some, uh, put some rounds down range with the AR-15. And... I'm gonna let my boy Hayden hold my phone. I'm gonna do a little quick 20 with the nice 4K aerial video. And I'll also probably be live streaming that to Facebook as well while it's in the air. Okay, well you know what else is public knowledge? What is this? Go ahead and let the world know. At least we know the vehicle and the tag number. So what? So, say we are just swinging away in the front porch swing out in front of Granny's. This is the proper step that you take. And for anybody that happens to go out that, that sees a cemetery in this shape, sees headstones that are destroyed, uh, for one, we need to take the proactive approach to uh, to reporting this, and it's a hate crime, folks. It's an absolute hate crime. Priority list. So, you know, I reported on Medville, Mississippi, yesterday, and they do not have a flagpole at their city hall or Meadville, and there should never be a city that takes state funding state-funded tax dollars and also has the, their own tax money that they collect themselves and not be able to afford to put a flagpole up. So, my name is Matt Reardon, also known as the Oxford Outlaw. Three years ago, I was unlawfully arrested May 1st, standing in front of the Confederate statue holding the state flag of Mississippi, and this was reported on in many different outlets. It's reported on even in many court filings that I was arrested for waving the state flag of Mississippi and not having a permit. Now, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic, and I took this oath back at the end of 2007. Actually, I joined in December 2007. Went to boot camp, so I did a MEPS swearing of the oath. I did a Paris Island swearing of the oath. My oath never expired. There's nothing in that oath that says that it expires when you get out. Now, I've talked about this, and it's because uh, anytime somebody joins the military, takes that step, they write a blank check to the government for an amount up to and including their life. They don't know where they're going to go, but they're following orders. So, unlawful arrest was made May 1st, all because I was standing on public property in a place that did not want the state flag flying. That was ultimately 
that was me petitioning the government for a redress of grievances, among other things, during the month of May of 2017. May 26th, I was arrested. I was surrounded on the square by deputies who pulled me out of my car, brought me to the jail, wouldn't tell me what they were charging me with until they got me there. And it was at that point that I was told on or before May 8th that I had put Todd and Ashley Lynch in fear of their life with an AR-15. Funny thing is, I purchased that AR-15 on May 20th. And I purchased that AR-15 after a death threat was made and was sent to me. I met with the FBI May 25th in regards to the death threat in regards also to Robin Tannehill and Ray Tannehill. Robin Tannehill who is the mayor of Oxford now the 36th mayor of Oxford. She was the, I know for a fact, and I don't know the other 35 mayors, I, did, I know Pat Patterson. I don't know if she was the first illegitimate mayor, but I want to say that she, prob but she probably is the first illegitimate mayor of the city of Oxford. And I say that for a very particular reason. It was about May 15th. About May 15th, I was at a city hall meeting in Oxford. Pat Patterson, the current mayor of Oxford, would not let me speak out to show that, or to, to address the Board of Aldermen, as well as him, on the city's willful refusal to fly the state flag of Mississippi, yet taking tax dollars from the state. He told me I had to be signed up and put on the agenda. And I didn't agree with that. And I labeled him and every single one of the Board of Aldermen cultural Marxists if they openly took tax dollars from the state and refused to fly the state flag. I left, it was that very meeting, see I had a gun on my hip, as I'm legally allowed to do. Mississippi is a constitutional carry state, signed into law, constitutional carry, signed into law by Governor Bill Bryant at the time. So I'm doing what I'm legally allowed to do, legislatively allowed to do, which is address our government, and now supporting my Second Amendment right. Holster. May 20th, I go and I get the AR-15 after it was reported that I had a death threat on me. And I've wanted an AR, I wanted an AR-15 for a while anyway, so that just gave me a perfect excuse to get it. May 23rd, or May 22nd, Robin Tannehill and her husband Ray, who is a well-known attorney here in Oxford. See, Ray acted as her attorney and taking out an emergency injunction against me, which I was hunted down, pulled over on campus by two sheriff's deputies on May 23rd. I was ordered by this injunction to stay 500 yards away from the Tannehills, to not contact them, anything. Well. See, June 6th, I was on the agenda to address the board, well, the board of aldermen, and the mayor at City Hall. And June 6th was also, coincidentally, the day that the mayor was to be elected. 
So this emergency injunction was taken out two weeks prior to the board alderman meeting, which I was slated to speak out and actually address the board. May 26th, arrested, held illegally, unlawfully held until May 30th, where I was brought before judge, Judge Carolyn Bell, Democrat, nasty Democrat, disgusting Democrat, who met with a, a sheriff's investigator or sheriff's deputy behind closed doors for approximately 10 minutes while I sat in the courtroom in an orange jumpsuit. She came out. She read me what the charge was. I said, Your Honor, I would like to address the court. You see, I had 100% proof that I could not have committed the crime in question. 100% proof. And 100% proof that the state had absolutely no evidence to back up their baseless, ridiculous, politically charged charge that they put against me. And crooked Judge Bell said, Mr. Reardon, you've got the right to remain silent. And I said, I know what my rights are. Don't choose to invoke that right. I want to invoke the first, my freedom of speech, to address this court. And she said, once again, Mr. Reardon, you have the right to remain silent. I'm setting your bond at $150,000. Have a good day. The things I wanted to lash out and say to her. Because, see, it didn't set well to Judge Bell to have a conservative prowl in the square standing in front of the Confederate statue holding the state flag of Mississippi having a gun on his on his hip. That did not sit well with this with this judge. Long story short, just to save a whole bunch of time, because God knows I've got plenty of videos about all this, about all the factual detail. On July 7th of this year, so I went back to Oxford after being banished from the city of Oxford in Lafayette County for five years. Well, for the term of my supervised probation, I returned to Oxford about three months ago to go on a go into a discovery phase, if nothing else, to document everything and to get to the bottom of all of the disgusting corruption that I didn't even have a sliver of a piece of knowledge and exactly how disgusting and, and corruption ridden this case was, the Sheriff's Department was, the FBI was, the U.S. Attorney's Office is. God. These people are literally, I mean, I, I've, I've never in my life witnessed just mind-boggling, unsurpassable amounts of corruption. I have, I mean, it's, it's literally been a game of David versus Goliath. Since day one, I've been fought on everything. This has all been a big joke to these people. To completely just gaff a Freedom of Information Act request. Oh, I, I, I've done several 
public record request for information. Several. Um, guys, do me a favor. If you don't mind, share this live stream. Help load some people up on it. Don't be, don't be, uh, please, don't be part of the problem. Like the corrupt news media that is trying to shuffle this under the table. Not one news station, every single one of them, have gotten the evidence, have been presented the, the uh, filing, and I mean there's not the first one that has reached out for an interview on this particular scandal. This is a public corruption scandal, a quid pro quo. Public corruption scandal that benefited four different parties. It involves two different agencies, at least two. Might even be three, it might even be four that I figure out by the end of it. But I know the Lafayette County Sheriff's Department, I know the FBI, those two agencies are complete obstructionist clowns. I say that with confidence. Clowns. I'm not against law enforcement. I think our society needs law enforcement. Look at Portland. Look at St. Louis. Or not St. Louis. Look at uh, Chicago. If that's not evidence of it, I don't know what is. The problem is it's a cancer called trickle-down corruption that is absolutely, literally plaguing agencies and departments across our country. When you have orders that come down from the top that others have to follow, and it's either follow it or face repercussions, possibly even losing your job. And it pins good people into a conflict between good and evil. And that's where we find ourselves right here with this. See, I have no fear. I'll climb the tallest of mountains. I have no problem aiming to take the head off the snake when it comes to corruption. It's part of my oath. It's part of my oath that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Hey, Ann, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in. I know it's late. I wish I would have uh, come live to deliver this just a little bit earlier. I'm going to take a quick one minute break. I'm going to send this over to um, I'm going to send this over to the movie trailer for Riding with the Outlaw. If you haven't gone to the Riding with the Outlaw Facebook page yet, please go there. Like and follow the page. I don't actively update that Facebook page like I should. So I'm going to make um, a concerted effort to definitely start updating Riding with the Outlaw more and more as far as the Facebook page. The Oxford Outlaw Facebook page, that's where you'll find me on most of the time. So if you have not followed the Oxford Outlaw yet, definitely follow that. Okay? Check out this trailer and go to ridingwiththeoutlaw.com to see all the evidence that I've uncovered up to this point. Okay? After this trailer, I'm going to be back. I'm going to tell you exactly who I'm suing. Okay? And what happened as far as this post-conviction relief that I filed July 7th of this year with Circuit Court. Stay with me.
Lee, the Tom King Jail. Oh, what's your badge number, by the way? A very quick break. Um, I wanted to, for those that haven't seen it yet, I wanted to show off the minute and five second trailer that I put together for Riding with the Outlaw. See, my story, I, want, I knew back in 2017 that this was political. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It was political. It had political corruption written all over it. Like I said, I just didn't know the, the extent of it. So when I put together the concept of writing with the outlaw, I had originally started it out as, as a podcast. I was going to go through my story and discuss everything as a podcast. And that quickly grew to um, video production, okay? I was going to video produce it. I was going to, you know, take scenes and um, quite possibly someday, you know, have material to, to work on a documentary or movie. Then I actually decided I was going to make it a documentary. <laughs> I started up a company called Outlawed Productions. Okay. I started up Outlawed Productions after I met with Sheriff Joey East. Joey asked me what it was that I was doing now. And one of the mayor's friends actually had destroyed a job opportunity that I had just started helping a friend out because she was friends with the mayor. She leased out business space and the company that I was coming on board to help had leased business space from her. And she said, oh, Matt Reardon? No, you can't be up there. Her name is Cindy Meek Brown, by the way. She runs, uh, or, or was a part of, HottyToddy.com. She's she's Ed Meek's daughter. She wanted to run around saying all types of just disgusting lies. Uh, the type of disgusting lies that you would expect from a disgusting liberal. She destroyed my income opportunity there. She destroyed my wife's income opportunity, who had also leased a space from her, paid her the money, and by the end of the day, the lease was canceled after Cindy finding out that my wife was married to me. See, I had her actually say, had her, had her go by her maiden name for the purpose of that meeting. <clears throat> so, Getting back to what I was saying. I don't really need that anymore. So I decided to make a documentary. I think it's actually turned out really, really good, especially up to this point. I published everything up to now. Uh oh. I'm fading out a little bit. There we go. I'm back. So July 7th, I filed a post-conviction relief. I just saw yesterday, circuit clerk didn't do a good job of informing me, that on the 29th of July, Judge Kelly Luther 
Denied. My post-conviction relief. Denied. In fact, so, order denying relief requested. This cause is before the court on petitioner's motion for post-conviction relief. The court considered the relief requested in the motion pursuant to the Mississippi Uniform Post-Conviction Collateral Relief Act, Mississippi Code Annotated Section 99-39-1. The petitioner alleges, in her aliyah, the respondent was in direct violation of the petitioner's 1st, 8th, and 14th constitutional rights at the time the plea was given. The petitioner also alleges he received inadequate representation. After reviewing the documents filed by the petitioner, the court finds it plainly appears from the face of the motion and prior proceedings that the petitioner is not entitled to any relief. The court finds the transcript of the plea and sentencing hearing in petitioner's criminal cause for aggravated stalking belies petitioner's claims for relief. Therefore, the court is of the opinion the requested relief is not well taken and is hereby denied. So, there are a few things here that really stand out. One, in my post-conviction relief, I raised the fact that Lafayette County, the Sheriff's Department, and the county itself have been obstructing justice by refusing to comply on a public records request and producing information from a May 24, 2017 phone call in which a call came in for Sheriff's Deputy um, Jared Bunder who took it and it was from this call that information was given that I was making threats on my Facebook page towards Todd and Ashley Lynch and their bar. But I wasn't. And it was from this call that Jared Bunder went and got a warrant for my arrest back in May of 2017. I just recently found out that all this stemmed from a phone call that he received May 24, 2017. So I requested that phone call, information about it. In fact, I wanted the recorded phone call. They started gaffing it off. They would not respond after that. I reached out to the county attorney. The county attorney had said he was going to look into it. The final day, he decided he was going to seal the record. It is not part of the Freedom of Information Act and denied my request for those records. The FBI, the entire time, has refused to produce the 302 from the, which is the, the formal police report from the May 25th, 2017 sit-down meeting that I had with him, where I discussed the threat that was made to me, the death threat, where I discussed my right to petition the government for redress of grievances being shunned by the incoming mayor and her husband, an attorney, who alleges constitutionally protected activity in his affidavit in her affidavit. None of that was addressed by the judge. In fact, even more concerning was Judge Kelly Luther, who denied this motion, was not even supposed to be on this case. That was the judge that had judged everything back in May of 2000, or back in July of 2017. Judge Kelly Luther was supposed to have been recused from this because Judge Kelly Luther was made aware of all the details of the fraud committed by the county. Everything. Outside of court, he was made aware of it via a lengthy email. Prior to me filing the post-conviction relief, my post-conviction relief was filed on the last day before my statute of limitations ran over. 
So I told the statute of limitations by filing the post-conviction relief. The post-conviction relief in circuit court was assigned to Judge, I think, Kent Brown. It's a new circuit court judge. Judge Kent Brown never once issued anything in this case. How is it that Judge Kelly Luther can come in on a case where he's not even assigned the, ca the, the particular case and where morally he shouldn't even be in the situation to begin with? He should be recused. And it's out, it's just, it's, it's outrageous to have judges coming in and making controversial calls like that on something where it's clear as day corruption exists. There was unsurpassable amounts of fraud conducted by the county, by the mayor, by attorneys, by the FBI, by the sheriff's department. To frame an innocent man, to disarm him, to get rid of him. All this just did was take a can of gasoline and poured it on the fire. I was already ready to take this to the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Still going to. But I got a very nice, wordy response to circuit court that I'm going to file, I'm going I'm to type up, and I'm going to file as a motion in response to that. I'll also be filing a motion to compel with circuit court. I would like to see whatever judge, if, it's, if, if, if it, we're going to have Judge Luther, which that needs to be struck completely off the case, Judge Luther has no business being on this case at this point. And by the, the way he responded, and basically saying the way that I worded my everything, which was worded, I thought phenomenal. He didn't even address the main topics in it that were jaw droppers. Judge Luther needs to get the hell off of my case. And the circuit judge that is assigned to it needs to respond to these motions. Anything other than that is absolutely pathetic. This deserves attention. Because this is something, in my opinion, you look at society. How, how society has just slid downhill. Tremendously slid downhill. I don't even know what it is anymore compared to 10 years ago. Now you got 53 different genders and it's like they're adding genders and taking away bathrooms. So I mentioned a few days ago, a couple days ago, that I had a lawsuit to file. The first of many to come. And due to a couple of questions that I had day before yesterday, I didn't get that filed. Today, well, yesterday, now, I did not get it filed because I got hit with the shock of Judge Luther denying my post conviction relief motion. So I'm having to respond to that. Don't have an attorney. I'm handling all this as my own attorney. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spill the beans. I'm going to let you know that I am suing the FBI. Both locally, as well as their headquarters in Virginia. And I'm doing it because the FBI has refused to comply 
with a FOIA request. The Freedom of Information Act is, I mean, it's a, it's a cornerstone for our rights for our society and being able to have transparency in our government to help prevent corruption. And when you have federal agencies that are completely gaffing off and ignoring a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, to produce something as important as a key piece of evidence, a document that would prove the innocence of a framed man, and the FBI has made on two separate calls in regards to this FOIA request. They've made claims that that 302 could not, they couldn't locate the 302. And now it's just silence. For about two, two and a half months past when I filed the FOIA, where they are given. 20 days to respond to it, to produce it. And I even put a, I put a rush on the documents. None of that mattered. And I, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, the reason why, well, there's two things, okay? A, the FBI had turned into a politicized weapon. And they had been a politicized weapon for quite some time. But they really showed their ugly face when President Donald Trump was elected into office. See, they never thought that he would be elected in the first place. And when he was elected, they threw every stop block, they threw every, just anything and everything they could at him. They tried to dig information up on the guy in unlawful ways. They unlawfully wiretapped General Michael Flynn. And it was at that same time, around that same time, that everything happened with me. Deny and obstruct. Deny and obstruct. The same two working tactics deployed by the Democrats for the last century. I got a question for the conservative base, for the silent majority. Why are you being silent? Why are you allowing this type of stuff to go on? Why is it that when you hear about stuff like this, that you go to another channel, that you turn your cheek, that you, you act like you didn't see it, when a statue gets torn down, gets removed, gets moved, when a flag it gets changed. Have we not seen the dire consequences in society that precedence sets when you give this smaller, steadily growing, but smaller, noisy, well banded together? group of rejects that we call the radical left, the liberal party, Antifa, the extreme version of them. When you give in to their demands, look what it creates. It creates, it creates an, an expectation. And it's no different with stuff like this. When you allow agencies to get away with not responding to public records requests, 
when you allow agencies to get away with framing an innocent person for the advancement of a political agenda, you are directly 100% allowing this atrocity to go on. You are enabling it. You are creating a monster, a beast that is out of control. And we'll get to a point that it can't be stopped. See, if society, if the patriotic Americans, the patriots, if society as a whole doesn't stand up, doesn't band together to reject this nonsense in its entirety, if they don't start pushing back, Do you silent majority don't stop being silent. Grow a backbone and a voice, folks. America is, is begging you to. Future generations need you to. Look at the millennials. That is a lost generation. I have not seen a more lost group of people than the millennials. What's even scarier is the people that are after them. The groups of people that are after them. And it's sad. I look down and you know, I see a handful of people that are on this live stream. I also see a lot of people that have got on it. What if it was you? What if what happened to me, standing up for our rights, our values, everything good? What if it was you? these people came after, if they framed, if they put a $150,000 bond on your head and wouldn't let you speak to show that you couldn't have possibly done it. Because if you don't speak up now, you don't ultimately take a stand against this. Especially with the way society is going, it's not a long shot to think that that, that you could be that next person. Because when they realize that they can do it and they got away with it once, it's going to create something that ultimately they can use as a, as a defense in the future. Well, we did it. Yeah happened here, becomes socially accepted. And society goes completely down the drain. I'm going to update the website. I'm going to post all the new filings on the website. I've got a lengthy lawsuit to, dra to finish drafting up. against the FBI they're in the chopping block first because there's absolutely no excuse for a federal agency to completely gaff off and ignore a Freedom of Information Act request holding key information that further proves the innocence of a framed man for those that um, haven't seen the documentary yet Go to either the Riding with the Outlaw Facebook page, the Oxford Outlaw Facebook page. Make sure you follow both of them, by the way. Go to the website, www.ridingwiththeoutlaw.com. I'm publishing, I've been publishing since day one, all 
of the evidence, all of my findings on the website. Because at the end of the day, it's the publishing of my findings, of the proof. That really is the only thing that protects me. Because so long as that's out in the public domain, at least they know that, well, the proof's out there. Anything that they do to try to silence me at that point, it's easy to see it as retaliation.